point we suspended the site and how it's happened. Um, the references to, to defection in canon law, uh, it was announced in 2009 that they would be uh, removed. And uh, it was a document called Omnium in Mentum that was published by the Pope. Uh, and that's available on our website as well, and you can probably find it online. Um, it's a very long, complex, legalistic kind of document. Um, but the, the, the major part that, that interests us is that um, thus we declare that the following words in the same code of canon law must be removed. And it, it, it talks about these, these are the three most important elements of canon law, 1124, 1086 and 1117. Um, they all made reference to the formal act of defection. All of those have been removed now, and um, that kind of leaves us in a bit of a limbo as to, to where defection is and what, what even if it's a, a possibility anymore. And we've had lots of information from people um, that have kind of a little bit of familiarity with canon law, suggesting ways we can get around this. Um, but uh, it. It first started to come to our attention when the actual Omnium Momentum was promulgated in April of this year. Sorry, that should be 2010. Um, we got a, a kind of stream, a steady stream of emails from people, mostly from trying to defect from the Dublin Archdiocese, who were saying that uh, we've been, we've got a response from the Archbishop's Office saying that there are changes to defection. We don't know what they are yet. Uh, when they come, we'll we'll let you know but basically we're not sure if we can process your defection as we used to before this change. Uh, so we had kind of been subtly aware of this before. We got a few emails from the US to kind of tell us that people that have tried to defect in the US have got similar uh, sentiments from their, their parish or their diocese. Um, so the, the emails kept coming in to us and we were left in a situation where we're, we're offering a service to which we weren't even sure if it existed anymore. And we we made a number of requests to the Archbishop in Dublin to clarify the situation, and we just constantly got responses back saying, uh, there's changes, they acknowledge that there's changes coming, uh, but they, they couldn't, couldn't elaborate on what they were. They, we got the impression that they didn't know themselves. It was the Vatican kind of pulling the strings, um, and they were kind of in, limp, in the dark. Yeah, themselves a little bit. Um, I should stress as well that the the changes we don't think the changes have anything to do with the amount of people leaving the church or, or our website or people around around the world looking to leave the church. It seems to be something that's been in training for quite a while, um, and there has been a, a kind of suggestion that they they've done it specifically to kind of close this loophole as such. We don't think that they're doing that. We we released a press statement about that then to say we'd. Re We'd suspended our service and we got a bit of uh, coverage of that as well in the Irish Times and the Independent and, and RT asked us to, to come on the radio as well and kind of talk about it. So when we did that, usually what happens uh, with those kind of media things is RT will try and get someone to come on with us for balance. Uh, the church, so they just issue a statement and the statement, this is just an excerpt from it, but it says the Holy See confirmed at the end of August that it was introducing changes to canon law and as a result, it will no longer be possible to formally defect from the church. This will not alter the fact that many people can defect from the church and continue to do so, albeit not through a formal process. So this has even caused even more confusion than previous. And um, we were wondering, how can you formally, how can you defect but not formally? Like, so is it informal now? You just kind of say it to yourself and then it's done? Or how does it work? So what used to happen in the past is that you would send off the forms to your local diocese and they would, um, they would ensure, first of all, that you knew the, the consequences of your actions. And that usually meant they would either offer you a meeting or they would kind of send you a letter and say that if you defect, you can't do X, Y, and Z, which usually meant you can't get married in the church, you can't have a funeral service in the church, uh, etc., etc. Um, most people are fine with that, and they write back saying, I don't, I, I don't want to meet you, I don't, I don't need to discuss this, I know what I'm doing. Uh, please process the defection. So they do that, and they make an, what's called an annotation in the baptismal register, which means you're officially not a member anymore. They they don't they cannot delete your record from the baptismal register. That's seen as a, a an historical document. Uh, baptism is a, a fact of history, and cannot be undone. Uh, someone challenged that 
with the Data Protection Commissioner, uh, I think in 2007, and they suggested that their records should be deleted from the baptismal register. It wasn't enough to just make a notation at the side of it. Uh, but the Data Protection Commissioner found that there was no obligation on the church to do this, that they were merely documenting something that happened in the past, uh, and that this was still an accurate reflection of something that happened. And it was, it was fair that they just make a notation in the register. And that seems to satisfy most people that have used our website as well. And we're kind of happy enough that if, that if that's the way it is, then we're happy enough with that. But what's unclear now is, is whether they're going to make this annotation in the register anymore. And we've asked them again, when we received this statement, uh, we had a number of questions to follow up from it, and we still couldn't get any answers. We got the same email back saying, uh, we don't know, basically, uh, and we're still waiting. So everybody that's tried to defect in the last few months has got similar emails saying that uh, something is changing, we don't know what it is, and we'll be in touch with you when we figure it out. I think the crucial point for us is, do the church still consider you a member? And if they do, then this has a whole range of implications for, for people's right of association and right of religion and right of disassociation, if you want to put it that way. Um, so there's a number of ways we could possibly challenge it. And uh, the first one is, I, I mentioned previously the Data Protection Commissioner. Uh, as part of the Data Protection Act, any organization that holds information on you is obliged to hold accurate information. And they're also obliged to divulge that information to you fully. So if you go to any organization, it could be a bank, it could be a um, political party, it could be anybody, you can ask them for a full record of the information they hold on you. and. If, you're, if it's not accurate, you're, you're, you're in your rights to challenge that and say, that's not accurate, please change that. So one possibility is that if, someone, if they send a record to you, let's say you ask for your record from your local parish, and you get a record back, baptised, confirmed, Holy Communion, etc., etc., maybe married, whatever, but there's no record of a defection, uh, and they still consider you a member, then you could challenge that on those grounds, theoretically. Uh, saying that that's not an accurate reflection of my position in the church. I'm not a member anymore. I don't consider myself a member. and uh, They haven't recorded that fact. So that's one possibility. The other one then is just the common law kind of uh, associate. I don't, I'm not a, a, uh, a law student, so forgive my, um, my attempts at this, but uh, the Constitution sets out various parameters about uh, you know, freedom of association, freedom of religion, um, if the church will not allow you to leave, it seems that they would be in contravention of the constitution. Uh, how one would go about challenging that is open to question. Um, we've had a couple of solicitors contact us saying that, offering ways that you could go about it. Um, and really, I think what we're waiting for at the moment is waiting till the church kind of formalise their new structure of the way they're going to deal with defections, and then we'll figure out how we go about it. Now, if, it, if this drags on for any much longer, um, it's already been dragging on for a few months. If it drags on much longer, we're going to have to reevaluate that. Um, we might have to get a bit more proactive rather than waiting for them to come to back to us with an answer. We plan to do something on the census, which is, uh, that should be 2011. One of the major kind of criticisms we got when we setting up the website was that uh, our whole kind of, the whole count me out name came from the fact that if you count yourself out of the church, you're reducing their mandate to be involved in state services. And most people came back to us and said, it doesn't matter what the church count as their number. The state only looks at the census figures and the religious numbers therein, and then they make their decision uh, on, based on that. So most people said, it doesn't matter how many people the church claim as their number. Uh, what matters is what's in the census. How do they figure out that the government only responds to what's in the census? It kind of stands to reason that the only reason the state do a census is to kind of keep track of people in work, people out of work, people immigrating, emigrating, uh, child uh, mortality, all that kind of thing. You know, that's what the census usually is, is aimed at. So we figure that if the number of uh, Catholics decreases in, in a significant way in the next census, it'll kind of send a message that the number of schools under Catholic patronage is uh, overrepresented. Uh, perhaps you might look at uh, the number of um, uh, church bodies involved in, in the health sector, like there's a, even up the road there's a hospital run by nuns. Most of the mental health services are still run by 
you know, uh, congregations of various descriptions. So, um, if the census shows a diminishing number and a decreasing number of Catholics, uh, I think there will be uh, a kind of there's more weight behind the the argument that you remove some of the this power from the church to be involved in education and health and things like that. Also, it, it's it's important to note that the second most um, populous uh, religious category in the census is actually uh, no religion. Uh, Islam, um, uh, the Protestant religions don't come near, the, the, I should have got the numbers, but I think the number that marked no religion last year was something like, uh, the last census was over 100,000, and the number that mark, didn't mark the box at all was 70 or 80,000. So obviously quite a, there's a substantial figure that consider themselves outside of any uh, recognised religious institution. So um, we think that's something that we can probably build on. Um, so we'll be, we, we don't know how to do it, how to go about it yet, but it'll be something, something on the, the British Humanist Association have done something similar, um, and the, their census is coming up soon as well. And they've suggested that, that people would reevaluate what they might mark down uh, in the British census. And British census is, is a little bit of a joke in terms of uh, uh, religious affiliation because Jedi isn't officially. Uh, people can put Jedi down on that and they, they can still get recognised as a religion somehow. Um, you put that Sith now too. Sorry, in the you States. You put that Sith as well now. Yeah, Sith. <laughs> That's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so, as I said, we think this has a greater potential to uh, to have... It, it provides greater way to the argument that the church should no longer have 92% of primary schools and X amount of secondary schools uh, and things like that. Can I ask what uh, <coughs> makes you think that this uh, recent change in the canon law is not a, a, a reaction to lots of people defecting? It seems that what, what the Pope uh, announced in October of last year seemed to have been one of those things that was ongoing since 1999, we think. The Pontificate Council for Legislative Texts or something, and they've been looking at this They'd be like some law reform commission or something, and they keep combing over parts of canon law to see what's applicable and what might be questionable. I mean, t t what power canon law has for anyone outside the church is beyond me anyway. Let's say in Germany, where you pay a, state, uh, a church tax, people have used it in, in that sense. And that's why I find it difficult to, 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 to think that they would remove that right. Really, if you get married in church, you're married before... God and your state. And the state, yeah. Whereas if you get divorced, you're, it's a purely legal thing. The church has nothing to do with it. Yeah. You're still married in their eyes. Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I don't care if they want to write my name down a few times, but if they're getting power with it, that's the Yeah, well, thing that's where the right census right. thing is important. I agree that definitely a big drop in the census numbers would be, and that, you know, it would, it, it would lend strength to the argument that things should be changed. But do you think that campaigning for a change in the census is counterintuitive because a census isn't like a vote. A census is what is basically what you are. It's a passive, this is a list of what yeah. I am, whatever. So if you're already, if you already don't count yourself as a member of the church, why would you campaign to say, just tell the truth in the census? That's essentially yeah, what you're Yeah, I'll tell you what, because um, what I've found, and I think what, what a lot of people find, is that Catholicism for Irish people is like they're blood type or their ethnic group yeah. and it's kind of like they think oh yeah I'm a Catholic I still had sex with my partner last night I'm not married but I'm still Catholic or I've used contraception and I'm still Catholic so it's it's almost uh, subconscious that you, when you get the census form you go yeah that's the like you know blood type B religion Catholic we're trying to get across to people that even if you're still officially a member you can count yourself out as uh, you know being officially recognised as a member in the census. So we're trying to kind of reach those people who uh, might just automatically put down Catholic uh, because they think that's what it is. That's, once, once Catholic, always a Catholic. We're trying to get them to maybe reflect on that.